Great. Thanks, um, everyone, for sticking around today for the uh, last panel, both here in the room and, and online. This is hopefully where we start to, to bring it all together at some level, um, the various topics we've had on previous panels. Uh, for those I haven't met, uh, I'm Brad Kroll. I'm the director of the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and I'm going to moderate this uh, high-powered panel of, um, of folks at the state and federal level, uh, on and we're going to discuss collaborative conservation, which uh, you know touches on 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 uh, wildfire and, and and forestry as well as many other areas of land management, and um, we're going to primarily make this a Q and A session, but I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, and, and put in context what their role is, and then uh, I'll start off with a few questions, and then we'll turn over to the audience uh, in the room and online for more questions. So, um, Sarah Greenberger, if you want to go ahead first and introduce yourself. Of course. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, Sarah Greenberger. I'm the Associate Deputy Secretary at the Department of the Interior. Um, thanks to Western Governors for having this panel and for having me. Um, I'm here to really represent the department, right, which has many different bureaus and many different uh, conservation responsibilities. And so, you know, a lot of different perspectives when it comes to um, engaging with all of the stakeholders that have an interest in the way, what gets conserved and the way that that happens. And so, so it's great to be here today for this conversation. Nita? Thanks. I'm Nita Culver. I'm the Deputy Director for Policy and Programs at the Bureau of Land Management. We are part of the Department of the Interior. And um, you know, with um, each bureau, of course, has its own identity. We, of course, have the best identity. Um, sorry, Sarah. Um, <laughs> That's why I have to be here to <laughs> represent the others. <laughs> Um, and you know, with with our, we have a very broad mission of multiple use and sustained yield, and so we do conservation as part of it. It's one of our key efforts, and it takes a lot of partners when you're working um, mainly across the West, but we have a few other locations, and there's a lot to do. We can't do it without uh, cooperating with other government agencies and private landowners. So, looking forward to talking about it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Clint Evans, State Conservationist for the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service here in Colorado. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I want to say thanks to the Western Governors Association for the invitation uh, to participate in the panel and have an opportunity to talk about voluntary incentive-based uh, conservation, which is what we do best. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon. My name is Tim Mock. I am the Deputy Director for the Colorado Department of Natural Resources. Just as a matter of context, uh, prior to this position, I was serving as the uh, county commissioner in Clear Creek County, Colorado, reside in Idaho Springs. So it really has been uh, interesting conversations going on right now about the, 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 the cross collaboration up and down from local, state, and federal government. Thanks, Tim. And I uh, appreciate you kind of joining at the last minute and uh, bringing a, a state and local perspective to this panel. Uh, you know, we've had representatives here with the Department of Interior as well as um, the Department of Agriculture, and uh, how well those two agencies work together uh, is critically important uh, in the in the context of collaborative conservation, as well as how well federal agencies work with state and local agencies. It all has to come together um, to make it work, and and co collaborative conservation can be the holy grail if uh, all the right ingredients are there. Um, it's important, but it's also um, necessary, uh, it's achievable, it's effective, uh, but only if there's dedication um, uh, at all levels of government to partner together. Um, uh, during our keynote earlier today, um, Leslie mentioned the America the Beautiful Initiative 30 by 30 and whether you love it or hate it. And uh, I was thinking in my head, well, it's too early to love it or hate it because the details aren't there yet. And the devil's going to be in the details. Um, but most importantly, if those details aren't worked out with the state and local um, stakeholders at the both in the private sector and uh, on the government side of things, it's not going to be workable um, politically or functionally, quite frankly. And so I don't know if I want to, if maybe if um, someone from, Sarah, if you want to take it first, or um, I could turn it over to um, uh, Tim as well to speak from the local perspective. but. Um, maybe just tell us where things stand with America the Beautiful and where we're going to go from here. Sure. You know, America the Beautiful is really, you know, sort of the conservation um, priority, the objective, right, the umbrella for all of the work that the administration wants to do to address, you know, a couple of key challenges, right? Nature is disappearing. Um, we have all of those challenges compounded by climate change. 
right, which not just doesn't just affect the ecological health, but also the public health and the public safety, as we've talked a lot about today, of the communities that we live and care about. And there isn't enough access to nature, right? So those are three challenges that the administration is committed to address through the America the Beautiful um, initiative. And I think a lot, some of the misconception is, well, what, that's something new, entirely new. And I don't think that's true, right? A lot of what America the Beautiful is is to build upon and help some of the real successful efforts that we've been doing over time. Many of the, thing, the collaborative work that's been talked about here today, the large scale, landscape scale restoration that's been happening in the West, but also in the Everglades and in the Great Lakes and you know, in, in communities across the country. It is all of that plus how do we do more and how do we do it better, right? And that's where this objective of can we conserve 30% of lands and waters by 2030, you know, meant to be an inspiration, right? And sort of a poke, right? In the back to all of us to, to do more. And I think that has raised really the question of like, well, what is that and what counts and what are you gonna do that's different? And, I, and that is still an open question Right, that requires the input of all of the different stakeholders in conservation, right? The agencies at the state, federal, and local level, of private landowners, right, of scientists, of um, you know, all sorts of different communities who have an interest in what gets protected and how we do it better and how we accomplish more. Um, there are a couple key principles, right, that the administration laid out in May. Right, of how we want to get to some of those answers, that it should be collaborative, that it should be respectful of locally led conservation. Right? There's a lot of pieces to that, but you know, how we get to that answer of what counts is still something that the agencies are working on and looking for input um, from many of the folks represented here today. Thank, thanks, Sarah. And, and Nada, I know you've been doing some outreach on this and you may want to speak to that. And, and Tim, if you want to speak to um, how the from a state level you guys are thinking about or hoping to be engaged and what the outcomes um, you hope to see. But Neda, do you want to go first? <clears throat> um, sure. I've been spending a lot of time um, at meetings of uh, county commission associations and um, different cattlemen's groups um, as well as broader discussions um, across the West mainly on America the Beautiful and what does it mean and I, I think it's the overwhelming um, feedback we've heard is we want to be involved. We don't want to wait till the end and get to give you comments for 10 days when it's fully baked. We want to be part of the discussion and I think it's something we started hearing before the report rolled out in May on the initial approach and have continued to hear and it's something that the Department of the Interior and the many agencies that are involved in this initiative um, have heard and I think right now we know we have um, an interagency working group that's looking at, you know, what counts, what does conservation mean, as well as what do we report in terms of progress on conservation. And what we are committed to is finding a way to have a parallel process that can feed into that for stakeholders. So we're, you know, we're not going to be fully done and then say, here it is, any thoughts? Um, that there will be a parallel process. And I think that's what's come out of being able to have all these conversations. So I'm looking forward to, to moving forward with those ideas and, and being able to reflect that back because there are so many good ideas. And one of the ones that, from, from my perspective, that is very explicit is building on existing tools. So again, we heard on the last panel talking about shiny objects. And that's another big message we've heard is, great if you have some new shiny objects, but there are things that are working. Um, our, our friends from the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, are involved in a lot of them, so can we build on those? And at the Bureau of Land Management, we know how to manage land and work with partners. We want to build on those. So I think we, we see this heading in a really exciting direction that it's not just measuring the contribution to, you know, with some specific metric. It's broader than that, and it's designed to support this voluntary locally led conservation and, and to encourage us to work together because I think what we've all learned in this room I'm sure you would agree is if we don't have everyone at the table we're not going to succeed so we are really aware of that and, and trying to build that in going forward and, and I can tell you I'm seeing it's happening. 
Thank you, Nada. Uh, Tim, you want to speak to your hopes and fears from the state perspective on this? <laughs> hopes and fears. No, actually, uh, from the state, we see a lot of opportunities in this in this effort, and also a lot of synergies with uh, in, in parallels to some existing programs and initiatives that we have going on right now. Um, we've been a part of that inter interagency effort uh, right now, uh, taking stock of the state's land and resources and assessing the effectiveness of uh, the existing programs uh, and protective me mechanisms um, and management provisions and achieving priority conservation outcomes um, and then in order to inform uh, or identify the gaps uh, and inform our future policy initiatives uh, what's also cool about this is that what it, it aligns with another initiative that we've kicked off uh, started off with the executive order from uh, governor jared polis and he mentioned it a little bit uh, in his opening remarks was our outdoor regional uh, partnerships and really thinking about um, uh, how do we balance recreation and conservation and, and looking to going back to I think something that uh, Aaron Kimple hit on was seizing on uh, local collaboratives and things that they were already doing. So how can we actually develop a statewide uh, conservation and recreation plan, building that actually with regional partnerships beginning at the local level uh, into a statewide uh, plan and then provide some level of funding. Um, 30 by 30, America the Beautiful, we certainly see that as an important uh, mapping exercise at the very least to help inform uh, those local and regional collaboratives um, in terms of, of creating those plans. So again, really exciting, but I also think that, you know, something that Leslie hit on, uh, our, our state is about 50% uh, private lands, and um, the vast majority uh, of short grass uh, prairie ecoregion covering nearly the entire eastern half of the state, and it'd be um, impossible to uh, achieve any meaningful conservation targets in this part of the state without the flexibility to draw upon uh, in incentive-based uh, conservation tools. Thanks, Tim. Um, Clint, I'm going to ask you what's going to sound like a softball, but it's coming from a, a point of a little bit of ignorance for me. Um, you know, coming from Nevada, where we have the highest um, proportion of federal land, um, I don't have a good familiarity with what um, a state conservationist can do and what role they can play in this um, in this arena. And it, I think it'd be helpful, at least for me and probably some others, to hear just what role uh, state conservationists can do on both the private and public side of things. All right. Thank, thank you, Brad. Really appreciate it. Yeah, so the state conservationist's primary role is to work with conservation partners uh, at their state level and sometimes across state boundaries, collaborating with their neighbors and, and their peers. And so, uh, you know, here in Colorado, we work, we've worked with a lot of partners, including our sister agency at the USDA, the United States Forest Service, uh, Frank Bem, our regional forester, and Jackie Buchanan, deputy regional forester, along with uh, Mr. Mock here with the state DNR and the Colorado State Forest Service, the National Wild Turkey Federation. We've worked collaboratively, what, over the last three and a half years on the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative uh, to do targeted forest stewardship and forest stewardship management. And so my role on that as one of the, the executive uh, board members with that team and that partnership has been to bring to the table of how we can bring in soil and water conservation districts and private landowners. It's nice to see a couple of uh, ranchers here in the room today uh, with the group. And, and those folks are key, starting from the ground up. And so what we can do through NRCS is help bring together those private landowners, our soil and water conservation districts, county commissioners, state agencies, federal agencies, and work collaboratively to start at that local level. And I've been so happy to hear uh, Sarah, Nada, and, and Tim all mention locally led conservation and starting at the ground up because it's so important to have that community buy-in. And uh, I think earlier in one of the panels, uh, somebody mentioned our regional conservation partnership program uh, project that was recently awarded in Chafee County uh, with the uh, American Forest Foundation and the other partners there locally, you know, and that is a that is a huge collaborative partnership that started at the local level with those community leaders. They got that community buy-in. They even passed a local mill levy and a tax to help fund portions of the projects. And when I saw something like that as a state conservationist and had an opportunity to interact with those folks and say, hey, how can we help? We started talking about the RCPP and how that might be a great opportunity to, for them to bring in USDA funding to help fund those projects. And so really I feel like a state conservationist's primary role is to help bring that collaborative together, be a part of that conversation, and then at times, to be totally honest, get out of the way. 
and, and let those local leaders set the priorities, identify those primary issues they want to target so that we can be strategic and we can get all of our state and federal partners and other local funding sources like local mill levies and things like that to come together and address those priority resource concerns at that local level. Thank you, Clint. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll open it up to the, the room and the uh, virtual room. Um, the workforce um, panel was, was fascinating to me and very interesting, and um, I was thinking about it through a number of different contexts, but I, what I don't think I heard mentioned was the prospect of a, of a climate conservation core and how that can play a role in all of this. And, and Sarah, I think this may fall mostly to you um, to, to speak to, but is, is that, um, uh, how real is that possibility and how much of a solution can that be in the larger context of what we've been talking about today? I mean, I think we're we're hopeful, but I, I think it's uncertain. So we'll have to see over the next few months how, or month how that plays out with you know the the conversation negotiations around the reconciliation package because that's where the funding would come from for for an, a large scale effort like that. I think if we are successful and we are able to stand up a, a climate conservation core, it could have a huge impact, right? Because a lot of what we heard was. How are we going to treat the, all of these acres? How are we going to deal with invasive species, right, which may not be as big of a concern um, on the forest side, but on the rangeland fire side, right, invasive grasses are, are hugely um, problematic, right, a huge part of that problem, and it's just a, an enormous task to figure out how to control that and a huge amount of labor. Uh, not to mention recreation and all the other things that, that um, that kind of core could provide for uh, accomplishing some of the, the big tasks ahead of us. I certainly know we're, you know, looking forward to the prospect of something like that in Nevada, where the majority of our land is owned either through Department of Interior or Department of Ag, and you know those two agencies work great when it comes to fire suppression, but pre-fire and post-fire and outdoor rec and invasive species management. There's a whole lot of um, coordination and collaboration that can be done to enhance that partnership um, at the federal and, and state level. So, you know, we're looking forward to it, and um, but it can't be done. None of it can be done unless there's people to do it. So, um, are there questions in the room uh, to start with or online, Troy? Well, one that I'll ask sure. is in in. You've talked about it a little bit, the uh, different efforts that Clint, for example, you're involved with bringing together across boundaries, uh, different ownerships, and making a project work. So I, and those are pretty specific, pretty local. If there are um, areas, and there's plenty of areas that, that there is a lot of collaboration on seeking solutions. Um, what are some of the areas that, that that kind of collaboration works really well? And then what are some areas that, that perhaps we could, we could be doing a better job of uh, getting those vertical layers of government together and then working collaboratively across borders uh, to get to get work done and that's not a question just for you Clint but you might have some good ideas on that um, but what are some of those areas that that would that we're doing stuff well and then some that we could explore that that would really benefit from increased uh, effort uh, thank you, Troy. So, so one of the examples I think I would use uh, to highlight is the Sagegrass Initiative that started with the NRCS and the Bureau of Land Management and our partners at Department of Interior and private landowners all across the western U.S. Uh, you know, in 2010 uh, was when that initiative first started. And through the last 11 years, over the past decade, uh, we've been able to work collaboratively with local leadership at the state and local level, with private landowners, with federal land managers, 
to address, you know, priority threats related to the sage grouse. And, uh, and I think now NRCS has moved beyond just the sage grouse initiative and we're working through our working lands for wildlife uh, initiatives. We have the sagebrush biome framework that each of the states work together with their local partners to establish priorities, to establish target areas. That's all coming together to continue on that good work uh, that's been done over the past 11 years. And then also on the, on the other side of the continental divide, we have the Great Plains grassland framework through the Working Lands for Wildlife as well that helps overlap with previous priorities for lesser prairie chicken. And so it, it takes it from a species specific initiative and, and puts it on more of this broad landscape initiative to where we can address multiple priority species, we can address wildlife corridors and migration routes, we can address concerns that private landowners have with ways and how they can manage the landscape or management tools that they have available. And it all starts with communication and collaboration at that local level. And then just one final comment, and then I'll let some of my peers here uh, chime in, is uh, we've been working closely with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Tammy Vercotter and her team uh, started developing the Central Grasslands Roadmap. And you know, that's an international effort with Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and numerous conservation partners all across the central US to look at how do we preserve our nation's grasslands? How do we reverse this trend of declining uh, upland bird species and terrestrial species across that landscape? How do we ensure that we at the USDA don't over incentivize uh, annually crop cropland based practices that would encourage producers to potentially break out grasslands? How do we ensure that we properly incentivize practices and activities so that uh, having a graze, grass based agricultural system uh, is there and for future generations? And so our, our working lands for wildlife, Great Plains framework, grassland framework is the NRCS's contribution to that central grasslands roadmap that is this much broader effort. And so it's things like that where we're having lots of success. And I'll pause there before we talk about where we have challenges. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to sort of poke on one of the things that Clint said and you know th thought about earlier when he was talking about you know the locally led work. Because I think some of those working lands for wildlife projects, you know, the Sage Grouse Initiative as one example and some of the initiatives that spun off from that, like the rangeland fire strategy are really great examples of how collaboration can work, right? Because you can bring the strengths of some of the federal agencies, right? Science across the landscape, um, management authority over, you know, big stretches of that landscape and watershed. Some of the technical expertise that NRCS brings to the table, an ability to understand if, if we really want to have an ecosystem impact, where are the places that are going to be most important for us to work, and marry that up with state, right, who have their own science, their own authorities and responsibilities, but also a convening ability, right, to bring together stakeholders. And a lot of the states had done that, right, to, to find the local leaders, um, a lot of the stakeholders from different industries, and find out what's important to them, and bring them to the table in negotiating some strong outcomes. That's all was built right on the local on the local work. So when you can have the local work, right, and local leadership, the real tools that states bring, and then plus, right, some of the, the strengths of the federal government and bring those all together, it can have a really, you know, important and exciting impact, right, at a larger scale. Troy, are there questions in the room or questions online? If not, I can well, fire away. I, I've, I've, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll raise one point, and that is, and Sarah, you brought it up, just the importance of good data for all of this work. And, and both, well, I'll point to NRCS and, and Snow Survey provides a ton of really critical data that, that plugs into especially water management in western states and that's hugely important especially as uh, if, uh, as this drought continues um, and and on for interior USGS is a, just a gold mine of data that can plug into land uh, land use decision making um, so I just want to 
plug those two for you guys and encourage you to make sure that that, that data continues to get used in, in positive ways. And if I can give a little plug to the states, there's a lot of state data that gets generated um, that if we could figure out how to integrate that into these processes and these systems as well, I think just enhances the, the entire planning process to, to make that work. Um, I don't know if anybody would want to react to that. I was just going to say, Troy, I think one of the places we are doing some of that well has been around <clears throat> the wildlife corridors. It's been focused right now on big game. Um, but, you know, there was a secretarial order. We were actually seeing data used that we were generating maybe from the federal side, but also funding research to generate more data at the state level, identifying areas. And it's something that, you know, was working and it's been built on and supported by, we have executive orders in Wyoming and Colorado. We have a lot we can do, though, f to build on that more, I think, too. So we're doing it well. And then it also points us to a broader direction of, how do we share data um, while we're respecting private landowners' information, but yet, you know, we know the wildlife are not looking for signs that, that say, you know, leaving BLM land, entering, you know, certain people's ranches. So, you know, there's got to be, we, I think we can continue to build on that and look at the benefits of those quarters, um, even though many of them started on big game, again, this data lets us see the benefits for so many other species. So. I've I think heard that's that one. birds and elk can't read those signs very well. You know, we we've, we've, we do, we might, you know, be able to fund an initiative on that someday, but I don't <laughs> think it's probably our best success um, idea. So we're going to keep assuming otherwise. <laughs> uh, go, Clint, go ahead, and then I'm going to put Nada back on the hot seat. All right. I'll, I'll save you for just a minute, Nada. I'm, I'm from Kansas. I'm kind of long-winded. So, uh, tr Troy, one of the one of the parts to your question earlier was, you know, what are some challenges, or where can we maybe do things better? And I think for me, I, I want to compliment uh, my U.S. Forest Service partners and state partners here on the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. Is that they brought industry reps into that conversation early, and folks like Molly Pitts and other folks from within the forest products industry. We're at the table and part and having a part in that conversation because you know we can go out and do forest stewardship planning all day long but if we have this plethora of wood products coming off the landscape but we don't have an outlet for it or a place to, to, for it to go or mills that are ready to take in those products then we're, we're missing the mark because we're not going to be able to accomplish the goals that we're setting out to achieve if we don't have the private landowners and the industry folks at the table early in the process to be a part of that conversation. And I think the same could be true whether we're talking wildlife management corridors or migration corridors or other things managing drought across the landscape. If we don't have those land managers and industry professionals as part of that conversation early in the process, we're missing the boat. Thank you. Thanks, Clint. Um, I'll ask a quick question, and then I'll give it to Leslie to, to fire away. So, so Nada, you have um, arguably the hardest job of any of us on this panel up here, and I uh, applaud you for being willing to do it. Um, you know, the, the, most of BLM land is multi-purpose land, and that uh, you know presents both op opportunities and challenges. But what what is the perspective from BLM in terms of um, uh, implementing collaborative conservation when you have that multi-purpose mission on your federal lands? So I think on one level, because there are so many um, purposes and resources that we address, it's inevitable that we have to collaborate. We can't, you know, managing 245 million acres of surface, <laughs> mostly across the West, that takes a lot of people. And we have a lot of people, and they're, and they're excellent. And because we... Um, cross paths with so many communities, we have to look um, to partners. And I think we're, we're pretty good at that. Um, and I think we look at it as local communities. So if we're managing recreation, for instance, or fire, we're working with our sister agencies in the federal government, but also with counties and states. And I think that's how we look at so many aspects of implementing our mission. And I think it's it does happen that different places have different emphasis and then the partners will shift there. And so it's one of our biggest challenges and opportunities to bring people to the table. But I think, 
I think we'll be doing more of it, obviously, but yes, that, that is the challenge and the opportunity. And I think we just have to recognize how many uses there are and that conservation is one of our most important multiple uses. And we're really focused on that in this administration and looking at all the things that can mean for ensuring these lands that continue to function for, for wildlife and for people. Thank you. And I think I can speak for both Tim and myself that, um, you know, the states want to be active partners in helping you achieve that. So thank you. Leslie. Hi. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I hate to be asking more questions, but um, actually one's sort of a statement from a stakeholder perspective and one is a, a plea. Um, so I'll start with a plea and it's actually not really probably best directed to anybody on this panel, but, but Clint, since you're with the uh, NRCS, that's going to end up on your plate, but it's really probably meant for Washington. But um, when we talk to landowners around the country, and this just goes on year after year after year, uh, the complexity of federal programs to enroll in, the multitude of them, you know, USDA has got plenty on its own plate, then you've got some of the DOI programs. And we just hear all the time landowners will say, you know what, I can't, even, I can't deal with it. I'm not even going to try. It's just too confusing. And, and government grants, uh, good Lord, I don't know why it has to be that hard, but it's crazy. So a plea is if we want to really expedite and get more people engaged, can we please look at those programs and figure that out? That would be my plea. And then um, the other thing I would observe is, and we hear, we heard it a lot today, which is that we need human beings out there doing good work and we heard it in terms of you know local collaboratives, but we certainly see it also at the agency level, right? We've seen the real shortage in the NRCS technical assistance, people to actually you know go out into the landscape and, and do the outreach with landowners, engage folks, right? People, and then people who even have the time to get trained up on the new programs as they come out. So we had Grassland CRP came out this year. We were super excited about it. Landowners went and applied and were met with people that really just didn't know what was going on in some of the FSA offices, for example, not to be critical of FSA folks. These guys are overwhelmed, so I'm hoping that maybe, you know, something that could come forward from the governors is some emphasis that if we want to see collaboration and good things done on the ground, we have to fund the people that need to do it, and, and that's from the agency side as well as the local. Thanks. You know, I, I'm really glad you raised both of those things, right, in terms of the complexity of federal programs, I think that's one of the ways and one of the reasons why collaboration is so important, right? You need to hear what are the real challenges that people are running into to understand what needs to be fixed. Because it's great to have a program, but if nobody can use it, then, right, it's not going to accomplish its goals. So, you know, that. thank you for that plea. And in terms of people, again, I think hearing that from you, right, and from others is, is really important because what those people, right, those technical experts, those folks that are helping on the ground, that are making things happen, that are getting people the information they need or the resources they need, you know, when it comes to D.C., those are called bureaucrats. And it has, like, this super negative connotation, right, that these are people that are, you know, standing a piece of paper and handing it on to the next person. And, and the, the disconnect, I think is, is part of the reason that it's hard to get the resources, hard to get the funding that the, that's been going down year after year, which only makes right the challenge worse because people aren't getting the service they expect from the agencies that they want to work with. So I'm glad to hear you say it, and I, and I feel like it's something that landowners and other private stakeholders you know, can really help with is changing that perception of what you know, a federal employee is who they are and, and, and the benefit that they provide to the communities where they work. And, and there might be even a state role in some regards to some of this as well. Um, uh, Governor Polis has actually challenged uh, the, the state departments uh, to be more proactive in seeking out uh, federal grants. And I think that provides us an opportunity looking for those, those projects, looking for the, the partners for us to play some role in terms of achieving those, um, uh, working through some of the paperwork uh, and also doing some of the cross collaboration. I, mean, we, I probably just have more of a comment than a question. I ranch on the Eastern Plains and Clint had mentioned the Central Grasslands Roadmap I've been part of those calls since it started. The amazing thing about that is we're talking about collaborative conservation. 
the Central Grasslands Roadmap includes Canada, the United States, Mexico, and all of the indigenous people in between. And they are all on every call. It's an amazing group that's trying to not even look at borders, let alone state borders or national borders. So that is a very important program. But on a smaller scale, the importance of collaboration is this. Um, we're in lesser prairie chicken country where I'm at. And a few years ago, Colorado, CPW, and Kansas, they put transmitters on several birds. There was a bird in Kansas that traveled 80 miles to come over into Colorado in less than a week. The bird came to Colorado 80 miles and went back to its original spot in Kansas. So that's something without this group of people and people who care about conservation, we probably wouldn't even know. But that's why it's important to keep these landscapes connected and together. Thanks for the time. So, yeah, go ahead, Clint. Brad, I might make a comment on the staffing uh, question. One of the things, one of the advantages we have through USDA and NRCS is we work through cooperative agreements and contribution agreements. And so I want to recognize uh, Commissioner Kate Greenberg uh, here at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have a cooperative agreement between NRCS and Colorado Department of Ag that helps support what we refer to as district conservation technicians. So it, it allows the NRCS pays 75% and then the Colorado State Farm of Ag and the local soil and water conservation district uh, share the other 25% to support additional boots on the ground and capacity at the local level. And the great thing about that is a lot of times we're hiring uh, folks from within that local region that are farm, maybe farmers and ranchers themselves. They've grew, grown up around these rural communities. They understand agriculture. They know how to talk to ag producers. And so it really is a huge benefit for us that while yes, there still is a learning curve and growth and training that has to occur over the first two to three years of their employment, a lot of times they hit the ground running a lot quicker because they know that local landscape, they understand the agriculture, they, they've lived and breathed the same air as their customers. And so, so anyway, so I think there's a lot of solutions out there and I know some of my other uh, counterparts in federal agencies can have similar opportunities uh, but I just really appreciate the partnerships we have here in Colorado because it's allowed us to broaden that reach. And I think statewide, it allows us to, to host about an extra, under that particular agreement, about an extra 25 staff here in Colorado on top of the 240 that I have within NRCS as federal employees. And then we have numerous other partner agreements with other non-government organizations and other state agencies as well uh, that helps put boots on the ground. So just want to put a plug in for that, that those collaborative partnerships also can include uh, staff to help get that work done. Thanks, Clint. Um, I, I apologize that I forget who said this, but it was an interesting comment um, earlier that it's not about counting acres, but making acres count. Mm -hmm. And they, thank you. <laughs> um, and and I and I started to chew on that. I said, you know, what does that mean, and how do we identify, you know, what acres deserve, you know, uh, priority, and and what makes it count, and. Um, there was a comment earlier about a fire that came over the Continental Divide. Well, out west in the Sierras this year, um, we've had, uh, you know, fires never come over the crest of the Sierra. Well, we had two come over the crest this year for the first time ever. And uh, the Caldor fire, which came over the, the crest and into the Tahoe Basin, when it got into the Tahoe Basin, it was raging. But we had done treatment in that area and had acres that counted, and it's what saved lives and saved homes. But we're so far behind in forest management, and then you have the compounding effects of, of climate change on top of that. Um, you know, to whoever on the panel wants to address this, but how do we identify uh, the acres that need priority, and how do we make them count? So um, <clears throat> right now, we had what I'd call a rather successful um, session at the legislature last year, uh, especially in regards to um, wildfire risk mitigation. Um, the investment was 10 times the amount of what it had been in the past. Furworm uh, has an $8 million uh, uh, ongoing um, appropriation into the future, so we're excited about that. But we're also talking about the color of money also and how important that is to try and remove some of those barriers. Are we perfect yet? No, but um, through Senate Bill 258, that was $25 million for community wildfire protection plans, wood product, uh, industry loans, workforce development. Some of that is actually gonna go towards um, the Colorado Youth Corps and the Lieutenant Governor recently kicked off uh, our Climate Corps here a couple weeks ago. Um, 
And I think that's about 7.5 million that we're going to get out the door between them and also Department of Corrections uh, SWIFT teams. Um, but also part of all of this, uh, there's a provision in there that we need to uh, take uh, an approach to identifying those priorities. And so we've contracted, we're working with um, Forest Service, uh, State Forest Service, BLM, um, uh, Division of Fire Prevention and Control and DNR to do a rapid fuels uh, reduction team identifying um, those priorities in terms of where we're spending those dollars and that's mapping the current treatments from st local state federal agencies you, you talk about this data and then identifying um, those priorities getting away from the quotas um, and we know that forest treatments know no boundaries, and that's why we're also excited some of these dollars can actually be spent also on uh, forest service land, so uh, not just uh, directed towards state private lands uh, in, in those respects. And so I think that's some of the collaboration that, that we really like to see and that's, that's going on right now. And, and how do we kind of, uh, as a state, step up? And I think we did that, and I hope that that's a model that we're going to continue to, to, to chip away at down the road. But I think also we got to give a, an, another shout out to RMRI and, and what that did in terms of bringing um, some regions together. And it was a very ambitious, and I'm not saying that it was perfect. It was, uh, I'm looking at Molly as we kind of sat around that table, um, but it was, it was very ambitious and I think having that ambition was was a, a, a real benefit to try and work and identify some priority landscapes to invest in but what it also did was it incentivized our our local regions also to pull together and so we've got um, some real good data in terms of in partnerships that were kind of set up through that program they're queued up and ready to go but they're also bleeding over then into our, our outdoor um, regional partnerships uh, the wildlife corridors is going to be some good mapping along those lines and that type of data anyone else want to address that if not I think Troy you maybe have some a question coming in from the audience somewhere yeah we yeah, did um, so daily Ed I hope I get this right daily Edmonds with Audubon Rockies uh, what the question was um, what can you do to increase the durability of and the resilience of these conservation efforts so that so that you're spanning across uh, multiple years but you know multiple administrations so that you're having some continuity there um, and I guess one of the other questions and we talked about this before is what kind of, of system can you set up that that is contributes to that resilience and durability by recognizing changes in landscapes and over time and and how different programs work and and those kinds of things but the initial one was on what can you do to increase resilience of these efforts generally Clint? yeah if i may thank you troy for relaying the question uh, i'm going to quote our former chief jason weller and one of his favorite lines was conservation is about relationships and so i think when you start having the conversation when you you hear people talk about people are our most important resource and sometimes folks think well that's just cliche and I don't I don't think that at all I think it's about the relationship so that as you know we at federal agencies we do experience staffing turnover state agencies have staffing turnover changes in leadership but when you have that core of the relationship starting at that local level whether it's landowners like Mr. May who's here in the room with us today or industry folks like Molly and other professionals that are continue to have a seat at that table and they can continue to help focus on those priorities I think that's how you create those lasting relationships as well as continued efforts to address those targeted resource issues anyone else want to take a shot of that so what you're saying is communication is key absolutely which so, is which is why we're here today absolutely He doesn't get to ask any questions. <laughs> That's exactly why he's asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> Sorry, boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's one part statement, one part question. So to that point, um, you, you have to look beyond what's at the end of your nose, right? And, um, and climate change, it, it, for instance, is, is one of those touchstone moments where um, the lack of you know, 
fourth foresight really kind of put us into behind the eight ball position. So my question um, to that is, you or my statement to that is that you have to have a, you have to have a vision. What is the vision? I mean, how, how many board feet do we want out of a landscape? How many acre feet do we want out of a landscape? Can the land provide that sustainably? A. B, if it can't, how do we, ad how do we adapt and adjust our economic, social? So there's a little bit of human adaptation, but also I think opportunities for innovation, technological innovation. My question in that and it's kind of related to the durability question is, um, have we identified and reached a consensus that this is our moonshot opportunity? And with the moonshot opportunity, um, n failure not being an option, are we there yet? Are we ready to launch four men into space to the moon essentially and do we have the the pieces in place to do that yeah. on a conservation basis I'll, I'll take the hot seat for a hot second I I think we are at an inflection point in a moonshot opportunity and and with all this uh, federal funding one-time funding potentially coming uh, the way of the states and and, and other localities um, it's on us to use it effectively and I Tell you from a Nevada perspective, I'm worried about our ability to receive it and put it to good strategic use. And even if we had the best plan, uh, having the uh, workforce to to do it in a in a timely and targeted way. And so, you know, we're thinking about that from a state perspective. We're looking at our partners in Colorado and other states to, for best practices. Um, but we're going to need help and guidance from our federal partners in order to do it. And if we're not all holding hands, it's not going to work. Um, we're on the front end of, of some good collaborative conversations in Nevada centered around uh, uh, outdoor recreation and strategic um, investments there, and, and and that cuts across everything. You know, if you're do, if you're if you're managing land well for outdoor recreation, you're managing it well for fire species, etc. Um, and and I should always say responsible outdoor recreation because I guess that's a phrase because it's an important uh, element of it. Um, but I am both excited and concerned about how we're going to um, leverage this unique once in a generation opportunity. And um, I'd let any of my other panelists here speak to it from their perspectives as well. You know, I, I think we're hopeful, right? And I think it will take, right, that really huge one-time investment to position us um, to seize this moment, right? Because I think everyone, is recognizing that things are different, that extreme weather is a threat, right? And not just in certain places, but in most places. Um, that the future is gonna look different from the past and we have to act now if we're gonna be ready, right, for that. So that's where I think, especially the federal state partnership is gonna be really, really important to figuring out how to prioritize th those dollars in the best way. And, you know, as Brad said, to getting the infrastructure in place um, to spend it. And it is gonna be hard. And I think it's gonna take a lot of creativity and flexibility from everyone um, to make it happen. Come on, Nada. I, I, I know <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I can't do it without your agency in Nevada, so you gotta speak to it. <clears throat> No, I, I think you know what's what's making this kind of an inflection point is we have so many commitments. Um, you know, we we can point to the ones in the federal government and from the president on you know climate being this, you know, the crisis of one of the crises of our times and and a commitment to work and in every way and every part of the government to address it. And we're seeing parallel efforts at the state level, at the county level. You see resolutions coming from every different level, be it a, a city or a town or a county. In Colorado, we've, you know, we've had towns saying, we're gonna go net zero and deal with climate. And, and it's great to see that. So I, I do think we have the tools um, to do that. And it, it is a lot. Um, if we get all this funding and we get all these commitments, that is the challenge. It's not gonna be something we can do in a year. So this probably goes back to some of the other questions about how do you make it resilient? How do you make it durable? And that is going to be setting up collaboration because it has to be able to, 
it's like passing it down to future generations, but in very short generations of um, be it an election cycle or an appointment cycle. And I, I think that's going to be our challenge for making this durable. We've seen certain initiatives that work and stay over the generations, whether they be long or short, and they are some of the ones that, that NRCS runs, for example. Um, we've seen that with this Wildlife Corridors initiative. Um, nobody's walking away from it and said we're building on it. So I think those are models we need to use because we need to design these approaches with the science, with the idea that we're going to share data, um, and with the idea that we're going to build for uh, the long term. So that's, yeah. that's where I think we are. I think, I think part of durability, um, as we were talking about earlier, is um, for the implementers to withstand the whiplash of different policies at higher levels. And hopefully we can uh, implement policies that are as immune from that stuff as possible because that's what's going to be lasting. Um, so there's time for one more question if anyone has one in the room or online. Otherwise, I know we have some people that are anxious to get to the airport up here as well. Um, but don't be shy if you got one. Uh, a good mic drop question, yeah, please. So a couple comments on climate change, and I want you to just tell me why my thinking is wrong since I'm in the industry. If I look at the perspective of climate change from a forestry perspective, if you have a, a warmer climate, you potentially might have a longer growing season and might grow more trees. If you're in an area like we are here, a more arid environment, then with my range degree, you are going to have less carrying capacity. My concern is we're going to study this and study it. We need to be in a position, most of our forests are fairly resilient, so we need to act and act quickly uh, or we're going to wake up and they're all going to be burned up, the bugs are going to hit them. So I, I would hope we see our federal government act and not with the intent of being of perfection but act and act quickly so i want a perspective from the different departments there if i could uh if i uh, about my comments tell me why i'm wrong well sir i don't i don't think you're wrong or incorrect uh, i guess what i'll say is in response to the previous question is i don't think we have a choice we have to act and i and i think for me as a state conservationist i, I like to see things get done and I don't want us to do a five-year research project to study how we're going to do it. I would rather us focus on the priority concerns that we all agree on at the state and local level, focus on those, and start taking action. And then where other opportunities present themselves, we can continue to build on that foundation so that we are getting things done. Because if we study it, we'll have lots of data but we may not get anything done. And so I think if we take action and find those, find those key things where we all can agree, where it benefits the private landowners, where it benefits the public land managers and, and citizens of the United States and the counties and communities around the country, if we focus on those things that we can actually do today, then we can address some of these bigger issues over the long haul. That's my two cents, thank you. And, and I'll give you a, a small example because you talked about market barriers earlier in the in the biomass and, and wood products industry, and um, and those barriers are real and they're a problem. And in Nevada, I have a, a, a little small one megawatt dream uh, because we have a dormant cogen facility that um, I could easily bring back online. And my goal is to uh, have the state be the offtake, have our um, inmates be. Uh, uh, operators at some level, um, and 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 um, also maybe uh, associate it with a, with a, a sawmill where they can learn other other skills, um, and that's my goal. And I tried to get you know earmarks are back, and I tried to get uh, an earmark so I could get that thing going um, because we'd early gotten a Forest Service um, feasibility study that gave us the thumbs up. It wasn't eligible under the 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 community directed projects or whatever your marks are called these days rules and it's just and it just it, it just becomes frustrating but that's one workaround um, that I'm looking at in Nevada to get around the the the, the power agreements and and those types of um, impediments and maybe it's something that could be looked at elsewhere um, and go ahead Sarah I mean I, I think the only thing I'd say is that I, I think the, the administration and the president has been quite clear that we have enough science to act and that we have to act now Right, and I'm sure more science will help 
right? And there are places where we'll identify gaps where it might help us with prioritization or to, but I don't think there's any question, right, that, that we have enough science to tell us that, that our moment is here. Certainly in the forest area, and I think in the rangeland as well, but I, there is some science in the rangeland that could be um, additive as we look for solutions. Yeah. Right. Well, thank all of you for doing this. Um, uh, we're lucky to have you out here and be able to do this in person at some level, and thank you to those who joined online as well. And thank you to Western Governors Association for pulling together these constructive conversations as they do so well. Um, and with that, I think we are going to turn it over to Mr. Augsbury, if he's in the room, or Lauren, go ahead. This is Lauren from Western Governors Association. Thank you so much to our panels, all of them today. You have all been wonderful speakers and we've learned a ton. Um, for our virtual audience, we will be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. For everyone in this room, we have um, a reception immediately following this, and it's in Evergreen 1 and 2, which is on the other side of the lobby of the hotel. Hope you'll join us and stick around for a little bit. And we will start again tomorrow at 7.45 with a buffet breakfast. So we will see you all then.